All right. All right, hello everyone. I'm between you and beer. Bad place to be. So thank you for sticking into the last session. I appreciate it. If for those of you that attended the session before, that was on Bluetooth uh, beacons, where that went into the technical details of the you know edge sensing technology, this goes into the how and the why you would actually use that type of technology. So stepping back to a higher level to understand where the applications are, where the meaning is derived, how you can make money off of using beacons, right? Because that's a part of what we're all interested in doing. Well, I know, not just beacons, but in general, edge to sensing technology. So my name's Jennifer Nolan. I'm a principal at Accredent. Um, I've been in the tech industry, oh my gosh, for over 20 years. Uh, my background is I'm an electrical engineer that focused in wireless back when wireless was not cool and uh, started developing uh, cellular networks back when digital first came out. So I've been doing connecting people to wireless and now things to wireless for over 20 years. So that's the scope of my background. Um, and what you hear a lot about things today, you know, connecting things, and you hear a lot about those things. You hear about smart thermostats, you hear about smart cars, you hear a lot about smart robots in the automation and manufacturing process, but you don't hear a lot about the customer experience and how the Internet of Things is changing how we perceive and act in environments based on this continuous interaction with products and processes and other environments. So that's the focus of the topic today is connected customer journeys, turning those IoT insights into interactions. And what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to give the current state of the IoT industry and then go into kind of a seismic shift happening that's driving a lot of this differentiated developments uh, around customer communication. I'm going to give a specific story around uh, business agility in this new environment of customer communication. And then I'm going to go into some of the attributes of platforms and technologies that help enable these type of developments to be successful in the marketplace today. So with that, let's uh, move into giving you some insights into Accredent. So what is Accredent, right? Well, as Kent said earlier, if you attended the Scale Up session earlier today, you heard some insights from Kent, the managing partner for Accredent. Uh, we focus on the business side of the Internet of Things. And quite frankly, we're experts in the connected data business transformation and how that business transformation and connected data disrupts markets and industries. And we work on mapping customer journeys to develop strategy for companies so they can build value and create that value into their business agility and how they themselves can disrupt the market with their own IoT developments and initiatives. So I joined Concretant over a year ago specifically because of these journeys. After all my years of working in wireless and connecting uh, people and things, it really came down to the business side of the, and the journey. Can you skip next slide? Internet Things really is the basis for the modern customer journey. And this is why I jumped to Accredent and left the tech world. Because I truly believe Internet Things makes it clear that digital technology is no longer another tool. Internet of Things, if you think about it, really allows us to gather a lot of insights that we never had before about customer experience. In association with products, within a physical space, different processes, and all of that is leading to the foundation of an entirely new way of doing business, as well as giving rise to entirely new businesses. You hear about these you know, new up and coming companies and the disruption happening. Well, you know, and the problem with talking about IoT, so I've experienced for years, is it's very abstract. It's hard to visualize, it's hard to understand. So my presentation today is gonna take a bit of a different angle. Uh, how many of you have watched big sporting events like the Olympics? Super Bowl, right? Okay, even the upcoming Final Four. If you watch of how the media prepares you for that event, it's like a week-long hype cycle, isn't it? They start to give you insights onto the sport, what the current state is, what the athlete profiles are, what are those personal stories? So that's how I'm gonna approach this presentation today. So you, because when you're talking about such an abstract subject, it's easier to talk in the context of stories, and that's what I'm gonna do here. So with that, Let's switch over. 
And one of my personal favorite industries is the cycling industry. I am a cyclocross athlete. Uh, how many are familiar with the sport cyclocross? I expect few, if anyone, to know this sport. Uh, cyclocross is a differentiated type of cycling in the sense it's not road, it's not mountain bike. It's the obstacle racing meets NASCAR for cycling. So you've got laps, you have pits, the environments are changing, there's crashes, there's chaos. Uh, it's high intensity, fast in, uh, type of racing, much like the tech industry, actually. And you get a bunch of different athletes coming in that maybe are from a road background, a mountain biking background, like, yeah, I can handle this, uh, with a lot of money behind them and everything else. And well, sometimes they don't do very well. And sometimes it's us newbies who are out of nowhere that do better than some of the professional athletes. So this is the USA National Championships back in Hartford in January. Cyclocross season runs from about September to January. So we race in crazy conditions year round, uh, most of the time. So what I want to first stop in, just like I talked about earlier, what does the perception that this picture gives you? What does this make you feel like? Cold, Cold? okay, yeah. Tenacious. Tenacious, yeah, you want to get into it. Like these athletes are trained and they're prepared for this race. Isn't this awesome? You're excited. Any of you were like inspired to watch this event or be a part of it, jump in the game? So this is the perception the industry is giving you, is that the IoT race is on, the hype is massive, right? Everyone's in the game, look at all these big companies and the startups, they're all jumping out of the start gate, ready to go. But in fact, the reality is very different. So how do you separate that promise from reality? Can go to the next slide and play the video if you can. Is it gonna load? Oh, please, this isn't. Yeah, we've had technical problems all day, and <laughs> and I unfortunately could not get the source file for this video. What's the YouTube? Oh gosh, um, here. Cycle cross men's signal or net sit US cross nationals nationals 2017. Yeah, well, it's a men's single speed race. No, scroll out and then single speed. Yeah. Yep. Come on. Yep. All right, we may have it. So what you see here, this is the first descent in this race. <laughs> All these professional looking athletes, and look at what they're reduced to. You know, a few of them are making it. This guy's trying to hang on for dear life. Poor guy over to the side just crashed. Uh, sliding on his butt, trying to survive. And he's getting yelled at, the leaders are coming, get out of the way. Some other just barely hanging on, trying to survive. Oh, there he goes down. <laughs> and here, oh, there's this one guy's got it, he's gonna ride it out. So this gives you perception of the reality. You hit that first downhill in the IoT industry and all hell breaks loose, right? No matter how much you've trained, how much you think you've got the best resources behind you, the best bike, the best team behind you. You know, honestly, conditions change. You have to adapt. You may, not, you may have trained perfectly, but when you get to the race, you don't know what that plan's gonna be unless you're in the moment. Let's skip to the next slide. So what really comes down to agility the cyclocross type athletes have to be an all around agile athlete. It's not like an Ironman where you train and train and execute and it's a perfect execution, right? You saw the conditions, they don't do this in Ironman. No way. <laughs> so what we see end up happening is as you saw those racers slipping and sliding and crashing, that's the state of the industry. You hear about all these companies deploying these IoT solutions to market, 
But the reality is over 60% of them are stuck in what we call proof of concept hell, where they can't figure out what went wrong. Why aren't they scaling? Did we miss the mark? Customers aren't using the feature. Why don't they love the feature? Everyone asked for the feature. It's not delivering them the value. What's going on? Oh, we can't get funding internally because we're not getting any ramp up. I mean, all these continuous dilemmas build and build. And why do, in our ex expertise, why are we seeing this happen? A lot of the time, it's because of the mentality of the athlete. Many of them are stuck in this linear methodology of build it and they will come where they focus on the product, they develop a process and then they launch it in market expecting people to be loyal and buy the product. But what you saw is like those racers are shooting down the hill with confidence, you can build the next one. It's because they have a different mentality. It's about adapt and, and they will engage, where they really focus their business model around the customer and then build the products and the processes and keep iterating around different data insights that they keep gaining every time they go out, it's being like on the race course. Every different part of the race course is a different insight that you apply and learn and apply on the next lap. And it keeps changing and you have to adapt because that's when you'll get the engagement and keep moving forward. Can you build the next one? So I'm gonna give, two, uh, as, you know, like you, they do in the sports analogy, right? I'm gonna give two stories of two competing athlete companies later in the presentation. One is called CompuTrainer, and one the Kicker Power Trainer, that had these two different mental approaches as athletes, one the linear, and one the more agile, adaptive type methodology, and how that impacted, and where did they end up in the race, given these mentalities. You can go forward. But before I do that, I wanna get into the why. Why do you focus on the consumer? And this is because of this seismic shift that's happened in customer communication. Now, if you think about it back in the 60s and 70s, it was all around a product-centric approach. You need this, you will buy it, and you will use it. Then it became about brand-centric. Hey, listen to us, listen to our story. It's our company, aren't you passionate about what we do? But now that's moved. It's become consumer-centric. It's all about me. How does this product fit in my life? Is it relevant to me? What is it going to do for me? I don't really care about the brand name anymore. It's all about me. And it's moving even further into this relationship experience uh, where it's all about the experience and saying, okay, great, this is just another product, but is it going to deliver me more value? Go beyond just about being about what I need and what I'm going to do with it? And as you can see, this side of the spectrum is really built around loyalty. You, have, you need this product and you like our brand. You're going to be loyal. And they focus all their energy on contributing to that loyalty factor. On this side of the spectrum, it's all about being relevant in the moment. And that's why that adaptive nature is so critical and very different than that linear approach of that expected consumer loyalty. All bets are off. You build. So what we see happening in these IoT developments, especially from the business side, is businesses are starting to get that. And from the business focus of the Internet of Things, most companies are, are um, investing around this consumer focus. As you see here in this um, stat, 43% are focused on building their business side of their IoT deployments around the customer. And this is supported, in fact, build again, from the consumer perspective. Consumers are willing to pay up to 25% more for a better customer experience. So if you're doing an IoT development, there's your ROI. You can capture more value from your consumers if you're relevant to them in the right time of moment and bring new experience and value to them around your product. It's a big justification. Build to the next slide. So since it's all about the customer experience, why do you do IoT developments in the first place? Because it's all about the data, right? Ultimately, IoT, all these edge senses, you heard about the last session, the beacons, it's all about the data. 
and using that interactive experience to derive new insights and new interactions with your customers in different meaningful ways and continuously building on that value. It's not about your product, it's about bringing value to them. So with that, you as a business athlete, you build the next aspect, have only limited control over your product, right? You control your product and how it's built and designed. How people engage with your product in different physical environments, let's say in a retail environment or an online environment. And your IoT type development methodologies. What are we trying to focus on? What goals do we have? What are we trying to differentiate ourselves in the marketplace? That's what you can focus on as a business athlete. But ultimately, all your efforts are tested with where you go to compete. Once you get out into the market, you're in the race. Are you keeping up with mobile trends? Are you even providing an easy, seamless way to do commerce for your customers with your products or your services? And are you socially relevant? That's a new huge trend, right? Are you, and that all those interactions with your consumers dovetail back into what you as an, you know, basically an IoT athlete are trying to do with your product in the type of environments. Maybe you have to change your methodologies and your approach to your development to then get back into another cycle of interactions. And these cycles are continuing to converge to really focus on delivering a differentiated customer experience. And from that differentiated customer experience elevates new levels of doing business. Maybe your product has to now go to a, a service platform. Your product's just an enabler for services now. That's a completely different new way of doing business. How do you adapt to an ever-changing environment? Let me move to the next slide. So let's look at an example of that. And I'm going to tell you a story about business agility. Uh, specifically, this is a rather fun one. The kicker killed the CompuTrainer. trainer. <laughs> How many of you have actually sat on a trainer indoors? Spin class or anything? Okay, so you have some perception of what these devices are. Now, CompuTrainer, trainer, how many are familiar with CompuTrainer? trainer? Anyone? Okay, we see we got a few cyclists in here. Now, CompuTrainer trainer uh, came out 40 years ago. And they actually invented indoor cycling. Started this whole industry. And now you have Wahoo Fitness, who just came to market five years ago. Relatively new and up and coming. So let's get into the attributes of these athlete profiles. And I want to thank uh, DC Rainmaker. He's a great product reviewer for the cycling industry. And if you have any interest in going further and reading the stories, especially the comments section after his review, uh, it's very intriguing. So DC Rainmaker, I want to thank the Fix Studio, who I train and race for. They provided me the customer perception of longtime uh, consumers of these products. And North Pole Engineering, who's a local engineering firm here, who worked with Wahoo Fitness to bring to market their IoT development uh, Bluetooth low energy and ANT plus wireless capabilities for this wireless train or for this um, trainer. So at that, can you flip? So CompuTrainer. Trainer, CompuTrainer Trainer again had this methodology of build it and they will come. It was all about the product. Now their product really has not changed much in the last 30 years. As you can see up here in the top picture, that uh, you know, trainer on the floor, the blocky trainer you load your bike into, hasn't really changed much. Over on the, uh, up by the handlebars, you see that uh, display, a bunch of different display units. That control pad way on the left side with that big fat wire coming down to connect to the back end of that, that controls your resistance on these compu trainers. It's a completely locked in proprietary platform. The hardware is only designed to work with their software <laughs> because it's all about their product being designed for maximum performance and durability. And they had a very loyal customer following. And they are the premier 
indus, uh, indoor cycling trainer for the industry. So much so that studios adapted them in math for classes. So for example, this is a picture of the fixed studio and you see this row of compu trainers. They use those for classes to help race athletes train under power and understand their baseline and improve. Now, Larry at the Fix Studio is one of the first studio owners to say, I'm going to have a multi-trainer environment. It's not just going to be a CompuTrainer um, studio. So he had to take CompuTrainer's hardware, reverse engineer it to get it to work with a different software application called PerfPro, and able to work at scale in his environment with different trainers. And he brought CompuTrainer in after he did this, you know, back in 2010, 2011, said, look what I've done. This is what you guys need to really consider. You need to open up your platform so studios like me, who are your massive buyers, by the way, so look at how many he's got, so we can interact with new different experiences and new different trainers. I said, absolutely not. You aren't supposed to do that. That's not how our product works. It's like, sorry, I had to. This is how it works in my environment. And they went away. In 2011, Trainer Road, which is a software application platform that went big for indoor training. So you know you race against your buddies in the Tour de France type thing, that's what they do. They went to CompuTrainer and said, hey, we are f committed to focusing only on software. We want a trainer agnostic platform on the hardware side. Can we work with you? You are the premier um, trainer in the industry. No, go away. Okay, later that year, a guy named by, uh, Chip Hawkins developed his, so again, back to that controller pad, He's like, this is crap. I'm going to design my own wireless controller pad to work with the CompuTrainer. Reverse engineered it and made his own controller pad. Went to CompuTrainer and said, look what I built. Isn't this awesome? Don't you want to work with me and let's bring this to market? Went, no way. He went left really sad. He's like, this is my favorite trainer. I've been a loyal customer. This is ridiculous. I'm going to build my own trainer. So can you flip? And that's how Wahoo Fitness was born. Guy who went to the comp competitor said, they rejected me. The whole industry wants to use their smartphones, their own tablets, their own laptops with different applications. All want to do it wirelessly because we're tired of jerry-rigging the CompuTrainer to work in our environments. I'll just go build my own trainer. That's what he did. But before he launched it, he started working with different teams. This is uh, Sky, one of the premier cycling teams um, in the road scene. And he went to them and said, I want you to use my trainers. And I want you to just, I'm going to watch and observe, and I want your feedback. Because before I want, do this, I want to gather all these insights from you as pro athletes who sit on these damn things all the time. What's important? What should I take back to my consumers? How do I make this the best product possible? So through those continuous interactions and that data, he developed a really solid trainer, which you can see you know, here. And he went from an open platform standpoint. He went to Training Road. He like, said, you know what? Let's partner. I'm going to focus on hardware. And they're like, great, because we want to focus on software. Great, let's establish an open platform. So, Because he, he said, I want a whole bunch of apps to use my training platform. It's the consumer's choice. I don't care, as long as they buy my hardware. So he launched a market with a couple partners and developed a partner ecosystem. And took it to even the next level, where he was watching and observing how people were using his trainers. He said, I've got to focus on this indoor experience. So he started, he came out with actually a wireless heart rate monitor. He came out with, and see that weird table? That's actually his table. <laughs> so he built this entire experience around indoor cycling. It wasn't just about the product. It was about the experience. And he's w continuously working on these iterations to advance his products, build a portfolio, and develop an open ecosystem where now 20 apps leverage his product. That's five years. So what's the status of the race now? Where's CompuTrainer at in 2017 uh, versus Wahoo Fitness? Last month, CompuTrainer came out and said, we're shuttering our production, closing up shop. 
the massive industry standard that's been around for 40 years is done, is not finishing the race. All because they kept refusing to engage and listen to their customers. And this is why that mentality of agility and adaptation is so critical as the consumer focus has shifted now from loyalty to being relevant. Here you go, the next moment. So as you're thinking like that, like, I don't want to be CompuTrainer. What, what skills do I have to focus on to compete in this IoT development race? And I'd say there's four key ones. Understand each customer journey is unique. Everyone's going to take their own path, as you see here in this run on the side of the hill. No one's going to follow the exact same path, but you have to enable all of this. Don't expect customers to be crammed into one single trail. They're going to take their own path and do it their own way. Enable them to do so. And if you lose connection with the customer, like this poor guy who fell down, get up, get back in the race, try again. Engage them at a different time, in a different way that may be more relevant to them. Remove key points of friction. In uh, cycle cross racing, I always say you always want to keep moving forward. As soon as that stops, it's a point of friction. Think about a commerce or buying e-commerce or buying scenario. If you have to stop and pause, you might not come back, right? You lost that customer. Remove those points of friction so they can do it at that time at the right moment for them. And this is the one we're most passionate about. Always be collecting insights. What does this mean? Like you watch these guys you know, running down the hill and the other one's riding. Watch how others are doing it. Learn and adapt to the different changing conditions. Because this is a lap race. It's always changing, always dynamic. Pay attention. Have situational awareness. And we're so passionate about always be collecting these insights. Flip to the next page. That we've actually taken all of our expertise and our learning. And over the course of the last couple of years, we've finally built our own platform, have our own patented technologies to enable developers. So how many of you are developers in this room? OK, so developers like you guys. Organizations, companies, I know there's a lot of people here who represent companies who are doing these type of IoT developments. System integrators and digital marketing agencies to really find a way, where do I start, right? Where do I start getting these in insights? Because my product isn't out there yet. Where do I start collecting this information? We have a platform to start doing that. To enable you to transform your connected customer journeys to be uh, enabled to have these connected interactions and build on that and focus on the customer experience and start to take that back into your methodology and your IoT developments within your organizations to say this is why. This is what we're focused on and how we're going to start to achieve this. These are the insights both inferred, observed, or you know, what the customers are telling us that we're going to work from. So again, oh, and to basically, um, sorry, to deliver those compelling customer experiences and business agility required of the modern business. Digital transformation and disruption is all around us. You now have to be a very agile, adaptive uh, athlete, business, organization. You're going to be transforming or you are going to end up like CompuTrainer. So how do you stay in the game? You start to collect these insights start to adapt, learn these new skills, practice on the course, stay engaged, keep trying, and that's what our platform will help you do. So if you have any questions, want to talk to me, uh, please feel free, Jennifer Nellen at accredent.com, and we'll help you get started too. Any comments, questions? Go ahead, Mohammed. Both. Because the mindset, if you watch, uh, go back to that connected customer journey slide, the one with all the circles in linear format. That's one more before that. And there. That is changing depending on your industry. So you have to be aware, depending on your environment, you know, where you're racing. Can you remember that image of what course you're going to try? 
understand what you do and your skills and your efforts are different depending on the type of competition that you're going after or the type of industry segment. So you have to pay attention, where's the consumer state of mind at as you go to start collecting these insights? Because if they're, you know, some very legacy industries, uh, for example, one of them I've been working in is water, right? Uh, infrastructure for water. And everyone says, hey, this is great. We want to advance water. We want to reduce waste. We want to focus on resource um, management and other attributes. When we start actually going to talk to them, it's all about loyalty still. They're very loyal and process orientated. They haven't moved yet into this uh, customer, consumer centric where the consumer is demanding, where's my water usage? I want to adapt to this. I want to change my habits. I'm ready to engage in the conversation, give you data to get insights so I can adapt and we can have a better experience all around. Water industry is not there yet. But for example, on the flip side, the retail industry definitely is. Retail industry is all about the experience. They've, they've launched heavily into this side of it. So depending what industry and how you want to approach, understand where your consumer mindset is at from the industry perspective, find those leading users if they're in this transition and go after them. Um, then also from your business standpoint, the hardest part, and some of you can attest this from who have worked in large organizations, is your organizational mindset. Because the whole culture of the company is built, let's say, on that linear approach. We're focused on the product. It's all about the product. We deliver, we have great product. You don't talk a lot about the customer experience. Well, then, then you're going to be fighting a different battle. So understand the mindset and how you can fit in. Um, some cases you can fly under the radar and get a quick win and start showcasing and show change and get investment and ramp up your IoT development. In other cases, it's not going to work and you're going to get stuck in proof of concept hell. Any other questions? Sure. Uh, so, for example, so the question is, and for those on the room, an example of how we've enabled this for a partner in IoT. Um, one that we've worked with in the past is um, you've heard the name Toro. Okay. So Toro is a use case scenario of where they were had a challenge with uh, within a retail environment, Home Depot. They were questioning and put out in the environment observe behavior and inferred behavior, what's going on? Why do all these people do a lot of research about our product when they're in Home Depot, but we haven't seen a product lift? What's, what's going on? Well, they came to find out that, how many of you drive small cars? Can you fit a lawnmower, or a lawnmower in a car? No, it's a bit of a problem. There's a point of friction. How do you remove a point of friction? Well, the consumer's not gonna say, hey, sign me up and get, no, they're gonna read it and walk away. It's not relevant, what do I do next? There's no next clear next step of action. So with the technology, they are able to be able to associate what was the dwell time? How did that customer click through? Did they ask for more information? Uh, did they go to our website? Did they give us our information? How do we retarget them? Maybe two weeks later, okay, they haven't made a purchase through Home Depot yet. They haven't figured out how to get the lawnmower home. Well, let's send them a coupon for 20% off for their pain and free shipping. Again, get back in the race. Re-engage with the customer at the right time on their uh, pain premise. Remove that point of friction. Get back in the game. So that's how they used our technology here to be able to get back in that game, re-engage the customer, deliver a differentiated customer experience and new value. Uh, you had a question, Joel. Mm -hmm. How do you capture insights um, and interactions prior to purchase to extract data from? Okay, so the question is, how do you capture insights and interactions prior to that point of purchase uh, to build that value from? And this is where, for example, um, you saw the gentleman in the past say, oh, beacons, right? Beacons have an advertising, go to this website. They understand the physical environment. There's also other ways to understand how people are interacting in the physical environment. Uh, for example, North Pole Engineering, who I referenced earlier, 
they have um, they integrate other Bluetooth sensor technologies and ANT plus sensor technologies within the physical space and collect that information and bring it up. So from a product side and an environment side, you can uh, start to map out how are customers, let's say, moving through the retail store, right? Do they sit and interact with the product? Turn it on, download, uh, preview of an app, some information. Maybe they sign up for some information. Maybe they shot, start doing e-commerce shopping. You can track that on websites. Maybe they start going to your social profile. What have they been posting on Facebook or things like that? Do they have any good deals? Let's look for coupons. So you start to bring together those elements of e-commerce, the physical space, the mobile as an, an identifier for the user, their social profile, how do they behave and interact on the social environment. Um, all those factors start to converge. That's all pre-purchase. Those type of insights are going to enable you to drive, or guide, I shouldn't say drive, guide that user depending on how they want to interact with you in to get to that purchase point. Maybe they go to the physical space to learn a lot, but they go home and buy through e-commerce because of the lawnmower or can't fit in the car, or they don't want to deal, they would prefer to just have it shipped, they don't want to talk to salespeople. Maybe it's because um, they need to be prompted, a reminder. They keep delaying. Yeah, I know I need to book that appointment, like I'm in the dentist office or something, and I need to, re and they keep nagging me about it, but I really just don't want to talk to anyone. Well, if you're reminded in a gentle way, like, oh, shoot, yeah, I really do. I'll do it on my terms. Oh, yeah, they've got a scheduling app already. Well, this is easy. I've removed a point of friction. So I'm enabling them to take that journey on their terms through a digital interaction. All those insights are collected before that actual action happens. Then you can build on that and dovetail that back into how do I change the products to be easier, the services to access better, uh, more customer base. Maybe I segment your type of profile. So for example, I'm a uh, West Suburban, Suburban mom, three kids, tech person. I'm completely different than, let's say, a profile person, South Minneapolis, who has a of uh, my biking friends who all live in South Minneapolis and constantly interacting with each other on social media. Well, we can profile and target different attributes. That's part of our patented technology. So how do we group you effectively to be relevant? Target you when you're ready to be engaged, under your terms, because then it's not advertising. It's like a tap on the shoulder. Does that make sense? So here's some. Oh, what Kent is showing here is, um, if you go to our Credent blog site, we have a bunch of different articles about this type of technology, customer transformation journeys, uh, our platform, uh, liquid intelligence. You want to talk a little bit? Yeah. So, so give an example of a physical space. So go back to that, that pre-purchase, post-purchase journey that was up there just now. So say I'm Samsung. Say I'm LG. I have intelligent, smart devices. So in this case, it's the smart, thin queue. And as on their point of purchase systems, they have beacon technology built in, as well as some RF technology, so we can tell all sorts of things about customers' experiences. They also have an app that you can load at the time and try their smart products. So this whole pre-purchase journey becomes an intelligent, data-driven, connected one. And actually, when they buy the refrigerator, after they got the free shipping retargeting message, and bring it home, that how many were at CES this year? Anybody? Okay, if you went to CES this year, you would have found that the mobile phones and the computers basically were replaced by smart things, be it Alexa-driven or you know, voice-activated or, or any number of smart, what I'd call IoT kinds of consumer goods. So as you get into that post-purchase side of an IoT journey, Whereas before, I'm doing a virtual, maybe combination of web and physical space. I'm moving over to that post-purchase side. And I am now dealing with a smart device that is continuing to create an experience for you, 
continuing to give me data back that I can use to create an experience and use that to drive retention, repurchase, and reference. So all of that connects together, and this smart refrigerator example is one that shows the whole journey from start to finish. Does that help? Make sense? Any other? Oh, we got more questions. I, I, I mean, I can think of a few post-purchase things like the Amazon buttons for readers <laughs> or the you know, Hewlett-Packard monitoring the ink and proactively sending it out so I don't have to worry about buying it. Are there any examples that you just think are really a really smart application that really stands out? I really like this one. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is one of Ken's favorite. You want to talk about it? <laughs> And people laugh at this, and one of the reasons people laugh at this is that it's pretty close to where we're coming to. It really is. Yep. And so, so it's funny, but it also gives you a lot of insights into what we're talking about. So AI plays a role in this, for example. Yeah, we're things that, I, I call it like the higher, um, the things in the background will do the low-level analytics that, you know, we don't, like to waste a lot of time on. We like going, yes, go to the higher level analytics is where we all as human beings want to be in a state of mind. We don't want to waste time doing the lower stuff. So uh, this ex um, describes it very low, like we're listening and sensing the environment and then prompting you to take the appropriate action based on what our algorithms, machine learning, and all these other attributes are anticipating on your behavior and helping you be proactive. So you can achieve that higher state of application knowledge and uh, intelligence. And by the way, my cell phone tells me right now that you guys probably want beer. So. <laughs> you got five. <laughs> um, any, I know there was a couple final questions. Yes. Um, for the customers that come to you, they're still kind of stuck in that product loyalty mentality. Mm -hmm. Uh, fear and loathing. <laughs> that was one of my, so it's honestly for bigger companies, it's the fear of missing out. And that's why I use that example of um, the perception versus reality in the industry. Because you get a lot of big companies who have massive marketing budget, and I was a part of one, so, and I've lived in this world. They will give you all the perception and marketing value, They're like we're great, we're perfect, whatever we do is gonna be big and awesome. But quite frankly, you go behind the scenes and watch that first descent, and it's bloody ugly. If you're really engaging as a consumer, you're like, this is awful. How do I, s I, I gotta go find something else. But that doesn't get out because that perception looks so good, right? So the fear of missing out, as they drop back further in the race and they start to see the ones who get down the hill, who have been focusing like the Wahoo Fitness, they start to realize yeah, maybe too late. Maybe organically, I haven't done enough to make, get that business agility, and this is where another part of our business actually is doing quite well, mergers and acquisitions. <laughs> so then you have to go outside the company because you didn't develop the agility internally. You gotta go buy it, and hopefully you can integrate it and not kill it. That's another whole methodology. Part of our business. So, you wanna talk? <laughs> so if you're with a large company and you don't think your company is gonna go there, and we're at a rather innovative and entrepreneurial show here, this, people leave and they go make things happen. And by the way, we have something called the Exit Accelerator that helps companies in this space do that. So that's another answer. Um, but transformationally, fear of, fear of losing out or being first mover are the two reasons that people do things in this space. Or they end up acquiring a company that they could have built themselves for $120 million later, and if that happens to be one of their ex-employees, you know? <laughs> I'll leave it at that. That's a good place to end it. So thank you, everyone. Let's go off to beer.